Hello, <clears throat> hello and welcome to our couch lesson number 10. I'm very happy to see all of you and I hope that you will spend a pleasant hour with us, maybe sitting on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand. My name is Jeanette and I work for the Goethe Institute in Munich. The Goethe Institute is the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we also encourage cultural international exchange. In 2020 and 2021, we are realizing a project called Generation A is Algorithm that is supported with special funds from the Federal Foreign Office. The project deals with the risks, the challenges, but also the opportunities presented by AI because we think that the use of artificial intelligence will change our society from the ground up. We are currently experiencing a new revolution, a time of radical change in which computers can keep up with the specific thinking skills of their users. And Generation A is algorithm deals with exactly these changes and their impacts on a Generation A that is still in its infancy. The project Generation A is intended to sensitize young adults to the technical and ethical developments in the field of AI, because after all, it is this generation that will set the course for the next generation, a Generation A, and their everyday handling with algorithms or off algorithms. What will the reality of their life look like? In what direction will artificial intelligence develop by 2040? How can each and every individual influence these developments? These and other questions are explored by the different formats that will be realized within the framework of Generation A. The project aims to carry the discussions from expert circles into wider sections of society to create space for critical questions about AI, as well as for testing algorithmic systems. Besides AI residencies, detox workshops and hackathons, we have organized the couch lessons. Every week, always on Wednesday, we discuss different aspects of AI with experts from all over the world. And we aim to provide a platform for an international dialogue between different disciplines and backgrounds, for example, with philosophers or with artists and their approaches to AI. Every week we start our couch lesson with an AI generated song and today you have heard the song On the Edge, AI generated rock music composed by a system called AIVA, Artificial Intelligence Virtual Artist. We already talked about AI and creativity and about AI and art in our couch lesson number five. And today in our last lesson before summer, we speak about the important topic of privacy. And before we introduce our today's guests, I want to ask you two questions in a little poll we have prepared as always. So let me have a look. I hope you can see them now. Uh, the first one is, are you concerned about the privacy and security of your personal information online? And the second is, do you think that data protection laws in your country ensure privacy? And as long as we wait for your answers, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of the couch lessons. First, our experts will give an input, each about 10 minutes long, and after that we will open the discussion. During the whole time, you can ask questions or contribute your opinions into our chat. And I will go through the chat and pick out some of your questions and then we can discuss them later. I will ask different persons to contribute their questions personally. But if I don't ask you to talk, please uh, keep your microphone muted. I also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will only the persons, uh, we will just record the persons that are speaking. And now I want to have a look on the poll. I hope you can see them right now. Uh, most of you are concerned about the privacy and security of your personal information online, uh, 82% and 71% of you think that data protection laws in your country uh, doesn't ensure privacy. So we will talk about these and other topics and um, 
yeah, I hand over to Martin, who is the moderator of the Couch Lessons and who helped me curating the series. And I want to thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin Tunkvist, and I'm a curator and concept developer. Uh, and with us today, we have Professor Karen Young from the University of Birmingham. We have Dr. Rand Hindi from the startup Sama and Varun Bashikala from the NGO Tactical Tech. I'm super excited to hear them share their knowledge and experiences of this very important topic uh, of perspective of AI. Uh, before we kick off, please keep what you're already doing, what you're already doing in the chat and uh, tell us where you're joining in from. That always makes for a more intimate experience for everybody. I am based in Malmö in the very south of Sweden uh, and our speakers are joining us from Birmingham, Berlin and Paris. Uh, the chat is also a great place to float your thoughts and ideas as well as responding to others along the lesson. Uh, it's truly amazing that all of you are here and decided to spend an hour with us. And so privacy has been a red thread in the past nine couch lessons. Uh, especially in the Q&A sessions, uh, it seems like we're reaching some level of maturity when it comes to critically thinking about new technological advancements. Uh, we've left the state where we just thankfully took everything that was giving us for free to be now to be aware that we're actually paying, just not in the way that we used to do. Uh, instead of money, we've been paying by giving attention to ads or by leaving data points behind us as we go about our lives. What's newer is the, that this pattern has been taken offline from that we can, from that we experienced actively in a, uh, in a browser to traces left behind when walking the streets of our cities. Shoshana Shuboff calls these types of business models surveillance capitalism for good reasons. That book, Public Juridical Examination of Big Tech Companies, New Power Position, and the cookie consents that we, that we need to give on every website that we visit, visit thanks to GDPR, are all part of raising this new awareness around privacy. That's great. It's at least a start. But what do we then do when we actually, what, what, but what do we actually do when we know uh, that we aren't all that private? What technological changes do we call for? What individual, what individual actions do we take? And what new laws are we asking our lawmakers to implement? That's the three big questions we're going to try to answer in today's lesson. Uh, our goal is to provide a bit of a framework for how to think about privacy in a digitized and gradually more AI governed world. So let's get started with the, the first speaker and the question of what privacy is in the first place and the complexities of dealing with it in law. With us to do that, we have Professor Karen Young. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary professional fellow in law ethics and informatics at the University of Birmingham based in Birmingham Law School, as well as the Com School of Computer Science. As an interdisciplinary chair, she is keen to foster collaboration between academics from across a range of disciplines and to initi initiate dialogue between academics and policymakers. Please beam your energy to Karen Young. <laughs> the screen and microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Martin, and welcome. It's fabulous to see so many of you here from around the world. It's a real privilege to share with you some thoughts about AI and privacy, and I'll try and be succinct and brief. So I guess the starting point is to think about what privacy is and why does it matter? Well, it would be no surprise to you that academics have been thinking and writing about privacy for a very long time, and there are many different definitions, but at core, privacy is concerned with the right to be left alone. But when we talk about privacy in relation to digital technologies, particularly in relation to AI, discussions about privacy have tended to focus largely on informational privacy, referring to our right to control the information that others have about us. Now, some time ago in the late 90s, many people claimed that privacy was dead in a network digital age because people now share freely and willingly all kinds of intimate information about themselves, suggesting that people don't care about privacy any longer and that public debates about privacy intrusions, particularly in digital environments, aren't relevant or important. But as the poll just demonstrated, privacy is something that we in fact do care about 
and a moment's reflection reveals why this simply isn't true. We continue to care about privacy as individuals and as a society. So none of us walk around without any clothes on in public, even in the hot weather, because we strongly object to other people seeing us naked without our permission and consent. None of us openly publish our bank account details uh, and so on and so forth. In other words, we all have information about ourselves that we choose not to re reveal to others except on a highly selective basis. So consider why, for example, we would strenuously object to the prospect of someone doing any of the following activities without our permission. Watching us inside our home, particularly when we're going about our most intimate activities, obtaining our bank account details, or reading our diary or personal correspondence. In all of these cases, we feel a sense of outrage. We feel violated. We would regard actions like this as serious transgressions of some important boundary that marks out what we consider to be acceptable because it's for us to decide whether to make this intimate information about ourselves accessible to other people. So sometimes these violations of privacy can threaten our security in the case of our bank details being made public. But in other cases, there may be no tangible loss or direct harm that flows from the act of being watched. And yet we still feel violated and outraged. And this reminds us that our right to privacy is so fundamental that it's characterized in law as a human right and worthy of special moral and legal protection, which I'll say a little bit more about later. So that's what privacy is. But the question then uh, arises, why does it matter? Why is it that we feel violated in these examples? Well, the answer to that is because privacy is absolutely critical for us to develop as individuals, to create our own sense of identity. And many of these things can only happen authentically when no one sees. And this includes our capacity to develop intimate relationships with other people. So two academics uh, suggested that we can understand the right to privacy as the freedom from unreasonable constraints on the construction of one's own identity. Because without some basic degree of privacy, we can't as individuals explore and play around with various aspects of ourselves. And these projects are essential for individual self-creation. In other words, we need privacy in order to be autonomous individuals who are authors of our own lives. So if we see that privacy is essential for individual identity creation, it's important, however, to recognize that privacy is more than just an individual good. It's also a collective or societal good. For unless the society in which we live provides the collective environment in which privacy is available, a privacy commons, if you like, then individual privacy won't in practice be available to us in any meaningful sense. So, for example, if everyone else around me foregoes their right to privacy and allows themselves to be subject to pervasive round-the-clock surveillance, but I don't consent, then I will quickly find that I'm singled out as an outlier and that I can't live and relate to others without also being brought within this web of surveillance by virtue of my associations. So this brings me finally to AI. So when I refer to AI today, my concern is with machine learning techniques that enable the algorithmic passing of large data sets typically to find hidden patterns, and these are already being applied in a very wide range of domains, which I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with. In particular, by collecting the data traces of our online interactions at the individual level across the entire population and apply machine learning techniques to that data, this can reveal patterns that can produce highly accurate predictions about us as individuals. Now, in many ways, we benefit from these techniques. Indeed, we're routinely uh, offered algorithmically personalized recommendations that are valuable and useful to us about products, music, and various other services that are automatically identified as likely to be of interest to us. But many of these increasingly commonplace machine learning applications have a dark side. And this includes threats that they pose to privacy and other fundamental values that threaten the freedom that in democratic societies we typically take for granted. Well, I don't have time to cover all of these, but I want to highlight a handful to give you an example of the way in which AI interfaces and challenges privacy. 
So firstly, the reason why machine learning driven personalization is made possible at all arises from the fact that we are now routinely subject to pervasive data valence, which is in essence the systematic monitoring of all our online interactions in order to create computational profiles of us as individuals. And that's necessary to provide us with personalized services and otherwise to shape and manipulate our behavior. So this pervasive automated digital monitoring that now occurs when we uh, engage online clearly implicates our privacy. But the risks associated with this data valence go beyond concerns about privacy because these profiles are routinely used to inform and to automate decisions, often in ways that may deny us opportunities and benefits, which may be life critical in some situations, based on data-driven evaluations that are simply not justified, of which we may be unaware and which we cannot contest. And they're increasingly used subtly to alter our beliefs and behavior. And I've called elsewhere this uh, phenomenon as hypernudging, in other words, covertly to manipulate us. So these kinds of practices are now taking place automatically and at scale across populations. And in doing that, they place our individual autonomy and basic democratic processes under potential threat. Well, the widespread take up of smart mobile devices and the increasing emergence of network sensor technology in our environments also enables this tracking to occur in real space so that our behavior can then be tracked in real time in real life at a highly granular level and not just in online environments. And for this reason, two academics, Michaels and Michaels, argue that this location tracking is game changing for surveillance because it enables even deeper intrusions into our personal freedom, because the data that's generated from this location tracking is very rich and enables many inferences to be drawn about us. And so they say that when we combine this location monitoring with all the other forms of network digital tracking that are now commonplace, the result is what they call ubervalence. And ubervalence integrates and centralizes all these forms of automated watching through sensor devices in and around us as individuals, through which predictive analytic techniques that use machine learning enable the identification, interpretation, and prediction of our unique traits and behaviors. And so they point out that this poses critical threats to our individual freedom and autonomy, and not just creating potential threats to our personal safety and security, but they might also have a, a chilling or modulating effect on the way we behave, as well as magnifying and accentuating the possibilities for actively manipulating us in ways that we're not aware of and to which we do not consent. So finally, this ubervalence is now being supercharged by the emergence of live biometric identification systems, particularly the use of live facial recognition technologies. And for me, the rollout of these technologies in public places is deeply troubling because for me, it fundamentally reverses the presumption of innocence and reflects the belief that everybody in that public space is under suspicion in order to justify the application of these technologies, which I think are deeply intrusive. And I strongly believe that we need to resist because they violate a fundamental expectation that we, we should be left alone. So I briefly touched upon the various ways in which AI may implicate and threaten privacy and other fundamental freedoms. And so finally, this brings me to the legal tools that we have to protect ourselves against these intrusions. And because I've only got a tiny bit of time left, I'm simply going to point to two important sources of protection. The first one is to the protection that we have under international human rights law. So as I mentioned at the outset, the right to privacy is considered so important, so fundamental to human flourishing, that it's considered to be a human right and is legally protected under international human rights law. So for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, Article 12, enshrines the right to privacy, and likewise under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 8 also protects the right to respect for private and family life. Secondly, since the emergence of mainframe computings in the late 80s, a new set of laws have emerged, which we now refer to as data protection laws, and these impose binding legal constraints on the way in which personal data, and that is information pertaining to a specific identifiable individual, 
may be collected and processed. But the strength and scope of that legal protection provided by data protection laws varies widely depending upon the jurisdiction and in particular the political and constitutional system which applies in that country. So for example, here in Europe, we enjoy the most demanding privacy protections uh, under data protection law and particularly the GDPR, at least in comparison to other states, including the US, which has a considerable more relaxed approach to data protection and tends to be much more market driven and sector specific. In contrast, non-democratic states and authoritarian states typically have very weak privacy protections. They may have some data protection laws, such as China, for example, does have a data protection law, but according to the EU, these are not adequate, so the data transfer from the EU to China is not considered to be GDPR compliant, for example. And in some states, particularly a number of African states, there is simply no data protection laws at all. So then let me wrap up with one final point of importance that I think needs to be brought in the frame whenever we start talking about privacy. And that concerns the tension between privacy on the one hand and transparency on the other. So in democratic states, the right to privacy, although of fundamental importance, it doesn't enjoy absolute protection because the value of transparency is also considered fundamentally important. In particular, the community and hence states, including law enforcement authorities, have a range of legitimate interests that may allow justifiable interferences with privacy in specific narrowly defined circumstances. In other words, legal recognition of the need to balance privacy and transparency uh, uh, is already given and built into the structure of human rights protection. So for example, if I share with you Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and I'll just do that now, you can see the text of Article 8 says, first in paragraph one, everyone has the right to respect that his private and family life, home and correspondence. But Article 2 allows for interferences, suggesting that the right to privacy is not absolute. So there shall be no interference by a public authority with the exercise of this right, except as in accordance with law and is necessary in a democratic society in the interests of, and then they specify, and you'll see that one of the legitimate interests is the protection of health. So, for example, this is the reason why it's legitimate for some privacy interference to occur in order to collect data about individuals in order to protect public health. And this is particularly important in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we're currently facing. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions about that, but I'm going to wrap up here and pass on to my colleagues. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Karen. Super interesting uh, indeed. Uh, not the least that last, that last point that you made. Uh, we will invite you back uh, in the end for the Q&A. So please ask questions in the chat and we'll make sure to incorporate them in the discussions after the talk. Our next speaker will uh, talk about how some of the current technological advancements in encryption can elevate privacy on the service side of things. Uh, his name is Dr. Rand Hindi, and he's the co-founder and CEO of Sama, a startup with the mission to protect people's privacy by preventing data breaches and unethical surveillance. Previously, he created a company called SNPs, a private by design voice solution for tech manufacturers, uh, which, he, which was then acquired by Sonos. It's a pleasure to have him with us. So please welcome Rand Hindi. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours, Rand. Thank you. Um, so let me just share a small presentation. I'll make things a little bit easier. Um, so I've been, you know, I've been really focusing on this intersection of artificial intelligence and privacy for over a decade. Uh, you know, I've been a researcher in artificial intelligence. I, uh, you know, I've been doing AI since 2003. And one thing that was very obvious is that the more data we need to make those AI systems work, the less safe uh, our privacy is. Um, and you know, over the past 15 years, we've seen the amount of data breaches online go from anecdotal to becoming a daily issue. And you have to understand the reason behind it. The reason is that the more companies are successful and the more companies aggregate personal data, the more they become honeypots for hackers and surveillance. 
Because if, you, if you're going to want to blackmail a million people, or if you want to steal the identity of a million people, or if you want to surveil a million people, it's so much easier to hack a company who has data on a million people rather than hack a million people's phones individually. And so there is a direct relationship between the amount of data a company has and the likelihood that they're going to be suffering a data breach. It's no longer a question of whether or not they will be breached, it's a question of when. And so um, you have to really think about this as a marketing equation. Uh, the return on investment for a hacker is proportional to the amount of data that, that they can put their heads on. Uh, from the consumer perspective, it's also quite interesting because in the media, we often think about data misuse about, uh, as like the primary sort of like privacy worry. You know, if you give your data to a company and that company does something they're not supposed to, supposedly people freak out. But actually, very few people do freak out. Only about 20% care about what companies do with the data that they give them. However, over 80% of people are actually really worried about this data being stolen. So it seems that the perception of privacy and the importance of privacy and what people really demand online isn't that companies, you know, do only what they're supposed to with the data, but rather that companies are actually doing everything they can to prevent third party access to the data. Uh, when you think about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, you know, the scandal you know, Facebook hasn't done anything new in that particular context. It's someone outside of Facebook who pretty much hacked Facebook system to leverage Facebook's data for something else. Uh, when you look at all the privacy scandals, you'll notice that there's always like someone outside of the company who actually accesses data unlawfully. So it's really important to understand that protecting privacy really is first and foremost about protecting third party sort of like stealing of this data. It's also extremely expensive. Uh, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because of government fines, because of you know, class action lawsuits. Uh, if you're a company, you get hacked, it's now basically very expensive. So I'll give you an example of how another field dealt with uh, theft. Uh, back in the, you know, 1800s, whatever, uh, when banks became popular, uh, you know, what a bank did is you went there, you gave them your money or your gold, they put it in a safe, and you would pay the bank to protect your money. And the bank in exchange would take some money and then they would offer some services, maybe a credit card or something like that. The more banks were popular, the more they got robbed because they had so much money in the safe that it was worthwhile for someone to come and basically rob the bank. And eventually the banks got tired of building bigger and bigger and bigger walls because there was always someone who was willing to break that wall. The way that banks actually prevented robberies was actually by no longer having the money in the safe. They basically dematerialized money and they prevented people, they, they, they removed the, the incentive for someone to come and rob a bank. If you went to a bank today and you actually robbed the safe, there would be nothing for it to steal. So the risk reward would not be worth it. But still, as a user of the bank, you can use all those services. It makes no difference to you. So what would be the equivalent in the kind of digital space? You know, is it possible to imagine using online services without those services actually having your data so that there is no reason for anybody to try and hack those companies because there is nothing to steal? Well, there is a new technology which is emerging, which is called homomorphic encryption. You can think of homomorphic encryption as end-to-end -end encryption for computing in general. So the same way that you can transmit messages to people without anybody intercepting that message, you can now also actually do something with the data as it's actually being transmitted. So you can basically transform it blindly without ever accessing it. So to give you an example, imagine I'm a, I'm a user and I want to get some kind of restaurant recommendation. The typical way that you would do this is you would get you know, your location on your phone, send it to a server, right? So nobody who's listening on the internet can see it, but the server who's doing the recommendation actually has the data. It knows where you are. And based on this, it basically returns some kind of like recommendation. And therefore, you know, as a user, you're like, oh, great, I'll go to this place. What this means, however, is that this company offering the service has a database of all of the user's location. So if you're a government and you want to surveil people's movements, who are you going to have? 
the phone or you're gonna hack the server, you're gonna hack the company. With homomorphic encryption, you could have the exact same service, but this time, the company itself doesn't have your data. It has no way of knowing where you are, but it can still mathematically analyze your location, provide a list of recommendation that it actually doesn't know either, sends it back to you and you can actually see it. So as a user, you can get this same user experience, but now the company offering the service has no idea where you were, has no idea what it recommended, and the database that they have is encrypted. So even if someone stole this database, there would be nothing for them to get from it because the data would be encrypted anyway. So this is a really important concept because it kind of like solves all those privacy and security issues, but it was too slow. Like, you know, a million times slower than doing the same thing without end-to-end -end encryption. So people thought, okay, well, you know, that seems like a good idea. Eh, well, no point trying to use it. It's just way too slow. And the reason why this is too slow, and I'm sorry, this is gonna be the only kind of technical slide, I promise it's not gonna to be too technical. Uh, when you encrypt data, in order to prevent people from guessing the data that's encrypted, you need to add you know, some kind of noise at the end. So basically the yellow piece is the actual data, and then you just add some random noise at the end of it. And usually that's not an issue because when you decrypt it, you just like ignore the noise and you still have the data. But when you do things with encrypted data, it turns out that the noise actually grows. And at some point, if you do too many things with the data, the noise grows to a level where the reservoir of noise starts overflowing on the actual data. And if you try to decrypt it, it's just basically empty. It's like, you know, just random data. And this is a reason why homomorphic encryption is so slow because you need to basically stop every time there's too much noise and you basically need to reset the noise something that's called bootstrapping. So when we say that homomorphic encryption is slow, is because of this noise that you need to manage all the time. So the name of the game here is to basically minimize how often you need to you know, remove that noise because the less you have to do this denoising operation, the faster things go. And there are really only two approaches. One of them where you need to denoise every time you do something, it's very slow. Another one where you can use some better mathematics, doesn't really matter which ones. But for AI specifically, that's actually a major, major issue because when it comes to machine learning, there is a whole bunch of different operations that you need to perform for the AI to actually work. And we had no way of doing this on encrypted data. There existed no way where you could take, you know, an AI model and you could you know, basically run it on encrypted data efficiently. It was impossible. The best that people could do was like some very, very, very simple stuff that nobody actually does in practice. And so the breakthrough that there is today in some of the recent research has basically made it possible to do AI on encrypted data by inventing new cryptographic techniques that basically enables you to uh, efficiently do you know, this end-to-end -end encryption without any of the existing limitation that people had before. Uh, and the kind of speed up that you get today is about you know, 100 times faster uh, than before, but it's still about 10 times and times slower than unencrypted. But at least now we know how to make it work, which means that within five years, we expect to reach something that we call the homomorphic supremacy, which is the moment where the cost of doing something encrypted end to end is barely noticeable compared to doing it non-encrypted. And therefore, there is no viable reason why a company would ever want to do it non-encrypted. So five to 10 years from now, we expect that anything you do online should be doable end to end encrypted. And when that happens, you know, the question is, why wouldn't people do it, right? Companies who wouldn't do end-to-end -end encryption, they would really need to have a good reason. And there really are only two reasons. One of them is a human needs to look at the data. You know, maybe you're offering some kind of service where a human actually needs to look at the data. Well, it cannot be encrypted if someone has to you look at it, obviously. And the second reason is because you're probably doing something really shady, maybe selling the data, uh, or maybe, you know, engaging in surveillance. Um, my personal opinion is I think that over 80% of what we do online could be encrypted end to end without any difference to the end user. I believe that you know, the moments where you actually need access to the data 
is very, very rare. So I just encourage you, you know, to, to look forward to this future where, you know, this kind of like dystopic view of like surveillance everywhere and technology kind of like becoming an instrument of oppression is not necessarily what will happen. We have the technology today where we could imagine living in a future where we actually feel safe going online, where we don't have to worry constantly about which government, which user, which company might interfere with our privacy. And this is really, I believe, less than a decade away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rand. Can I just ask you, will there be like uh, uh, marks on services, for example, to say that this is an encrypted, encrypted services or how will we as users know whether a communication is uh, open or not? Um, well, I, I don't have an answer yet to that, obviously, uh, but the way that I imagine it is, uh, uh, you know, back, back in the 90s, when you were online, uh, there was only the HTTP protocol. Right? meaning that everything that you sent on the internet was unencrypted. So people that you were sending the data to could access it, but everybody listening on the internet could also listen to your data. Uh, now we've moved to something called HTTPS, you know, this little green lock in your browser, which basically uh, says that the communication between the user and the company is encrypted. So anybody listening in between cannot see the data, but the company still has access to it and the user has access to it. I think the natural kind of next step is to have a new protocol, you know, for end-to-end -end encryption where, you know, a company using end-to-end -end encryption would just do it transparently for the user. So you wouldn't even like, you know, the same way that you have a lock, you would need some kind of like icon in your browser that basically says, you're accessing a service encrypted end-to-end. -end. There is literally nothing you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about people listening. You don't have to worry about the company getting hacked. You don't have to worry about surveillance. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even, it doesn't even matter where the data is going at that point because only you as a user has a key to decrypt it anyway. Cool, thank you. We'll, so please everybody ask questions to, to Rand as well in, in the chat. And now to our third and last speaker of today, uh, and that we're going to take into the, this more sort of personal perspective to privacy. So with us, we have Varun uh, Bashikala, a data scientist at Tactical Tech, uh, a Berlin-based NGO that works globally at the intersection of activism and technology. His work explores personal data, how personal data has become a political asset and influencing elections. So thank you for joining us very much, Varun. And please beam all your energy to him. Uh, the uh, mic and screen is yours. Thank you, thanks for having me. I'm just going to share my screen here. Hopefully you can all see it. Yes, and you can hear me too. Okay, great. I thought I would just start off with um, just talking briefly about AI. I think it's always tricky when you're addressing a large audience about something related to AI because often people have different understanding of what it means. So I thought it would just help to all get on the same page. Part of the challenge here is I think members of the public often think of AI as either something that's being used to save the world or they think of them as these dystopian robot armies. I think technologists often think about AI. I am a technologist by background um, in terms of machine learning and algorithmic systems. Um, these are not always necessarily things that are new. Uh, however, as Rand just mentioned in the case of the homomorphic encryption supremacy, things that might be on the frontier coming up. Um, often in the world of business, AI is just a bit of a buzzword that you fund. Um, and also technically speaking, there's, there are different kinds of AI. There's weak AI um, and there's strong AI. And I think um, you know, strong AI is about machines with genuine intelligence and self-awareness. But I'll focus today on um, AI in the context of weak AI, which is where most of its current applications live. I wanted to first start off with just touching on some examples of AI that um, a lot of us may have experience with, but may not have known, um, and then talk about some other applications of AI that might give us some pause. So first, um, if you happen to be a Tinder user, uh, Tinder recently rolled out an AI powered photo validation. Basically, this is a safety mechanism. So um, 
I think we all know Tinder. It's a date online dating platform. You see a photo of someone, you can swipe right or left. You can also see some text about them. Um, they can write a short bio. And um, one of the challenges they were dealing with was that um, people were often posing as um, other people. Um, obviously, you can imagine how this could be a safety issue if you're meeting someone for a date um, and the person you thought you were meeting is not there or um, it's someone else entirely. Um, so in this case, you know, I could, in theory, have a Tinder profile um, with my photo on the left, um, and then I can send to Tinder a separate photo validation, um, and they can do all these facial biometrics. You know, we talk about thumbprints and fingerprints. You also have a face print, so they can measure the space between your eyes, the length of your nose, the length of your mouth, those kinds of things. And based on that information, um, based on this AI-powered photo validation, if the photos match, if Tinder believes that you are in fact the same person, you are in fact the person in your photos, they'll give you this validation check mark. And that's a vote of safety for other members on the platform that you are in fact who you claim to be. Obviously, if I were to claim to be Angela Merkel, um, that would be quite different because I obviously am not her and we have very different facial face prints and um, that can be easily picked up through these AI um, powered systems. Same thing if I were to pose as Beyonce, obviously that photo validation system would not work. And likewise for Roger Federer, as much as I maybe wish I were him, I have not won Wimbledon before. Um, so if you happen to be a Tinder user or a lot of the world of online dating, um, these kinds of facial recognition AI powered technologies are um, already in our presence um, and have been rolled out quite extensively. Also in context that you might not be completely aware, I'll just play a short video clip now for all of us and hopefully the audio will work. So this is from an artist named Taryn Southern. She was actually quite far ahead of her time because she um, released this song back in 2017, but she was clearly three years ahead of the curve because we all feel quarantined right now, of course. But what's crazy is that this whole album, including the song of hers called Break Free, she um, made with AI. There are a lot of AI services now that are being used in creative industries. So in many cases, all you have to do is to feed these AI powered music generation schemes, a mood and a genre, and it can create for you percussion lines and melodies and chords. You don't need any knowledge of music theory. Um, and others will allow you to um, just give it some basic information about a mood and a genre, and it will mine tons of information online, conversations, talks, news, um, news stories, um, to, to provide you some starting inspiration for how your piece of music could sound. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. I think we are living amongst a lot of functional AI systems already. Um, obviously, self-driving cars um, are increasingly a reality um, in this day and age. Um, a lot of people don't realize some either, even some more mundane applications, when you send something via snail mail, via the post, and if you hand write an address um, on your envelope, um, oftentimes, the systems that sort and filter these mail, the, these handwritten addresses are um, using basic applications of AI to um, make what you wrote, make your address, what you wrote by hand, something that's machine readable to say, okay, you are sending this package to Germany, you're sending this package to France. Um, and that's already um, in our midst as well. Also voice search for anyone who uses voice search technologies. There's this AI powered system to connect or to associate what you say, perhaps with the own um, cadence and tone of your voice to something that can be understood by a machine. There are a lot of other applications of AI, perhaps ones that we may not be so familiar with or may not have thought of before. I wanted to share this image, which was taken from a campaign promotional video um, in this photo, you see a man in the foreground, his name is Koenja. He was running for mayor of Taipei in 2014. And you see him here at a tattoo parlor. Um, what's interesting about the backstory to this photo is that he's at this tattoo parlor, not because he wanted to 
learn how to give someone a tattoo, not because he wanted to get a tattoo himself and really not actually out of a genuine concern to be there, you could even say. He visited this tattoo parlor about two weeks before his election. And he went because a digital listening firm that he had hired for his campaign had made a list for him of activities he should do in the real world that would generate the most buzz for him online. And at the top of that list was visiting a tattoo parlor because the, the company believed that it would effectively engage young people. Um, and that's exactly what he did. And the campaign went rather viral in Taiwan in the weeks leading up to the campaign. And this, I think, is quite unexpected. The, the company that advised him to do this is called Autopolitik. They work extensively with political campaigns across Southeast Asia. And their tagline is winning elections with social intelligence. The way their company works is by mining information in the public domain. For example, things that you put on Twitter. Um, and what they do is they use a subfield of artificial intelligence called natural language processing. That's all about trying to infer things from text. Is there, a thing about, is there something about your tone or your sentiment or your attitude um, in text that you write that can be used to infer things about what you think? In this case, the company is interested in profiling people politically based on things they put out in the public domain. So I think a lot, not a lot of people realize when they tweet things um, that there are actually for-profit companies out there that are interested in inferring their political beliefs based on what they put out into the world. Uh, and it's actually being used um, by politicians like Dr. Koenja in this case. The next example I want to share is um, one that um, is, um, I figured, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. Let me just show you how many companies talk about AI and what they hope to do with it. So next we'll see a promotional video um, from MasterCard about um, how it's using some of its AI applications in practice. Worlds where billions of accounts are compromised. Been more important, but how do you bring trust to the digital world? Trust is all about someone, like Lisa, who needs to go to her coffee shop. Her barista recognizes her familiar face, her name, her behavior, and has her usual order ready: a triple latte, extra whip. Wears different clothes one day, her barista still trusts that Lisa is still Lisa, and she still gets the same great customer experience. Unitex knows Lisa sort of like her barista does. It recognizes her patterns and builds a profile of Lisa that can't be imitated, even if her patterns change. Here's how. Unitex uses four integrated layers to verify her identity profile. The first looks at Lisa's device, connection, and location. It knows that, even if the connection comes from Taiwan, it's actually Lisa using her usual iPhone 8, and not an imposter. The second layer looks at behavioral analytics. It knows that Lisa is a loyal Mac user, and always uses the latest version of Firefox. The third is passive biometrics. It knows hundreds of things, like how fast Lisa types, her typing cadence, and even the angle she holds her device. And the fourth layer is New Data's Trust Consortium. This brings together billions of anonymously stored data points across New Data's client base, and knows if Lisa is behaving like she normally does, or like a good user would. All of these layers are integrated and know Lisa's profile with near 100% accuracy. You get the peace of mind that your business is protected from fraud. And best of all, Lisa enjoys the customer experience she deserves. I think this um, ad is quite illustrative because in practice, I think a lot of applications of AI in the real world are justified under this um, pretense of efficiency. You know, Lisa wants to be able to walk into her coffee shop and get her coffee immediately. But I think when we think about the privacy implications of this, does Lisa realize that the angle of her phone that she uses to type messages or the, the pressure that she places on the keyboard or her typing cadence, all that is trapped in the process of achieving this efficient, efficient result. Um, and that's quite invasive behavioral profiling. 
Um, and in practice, I think it is a lot of um, often justified under the name of um, providing services that are efficient. And at one point in this promotional video, you heard the voiceover talk about identifying Lisa as a good user. And that transitions lightly into um, another application of AI that um, was quite controversial at Google, um, Project Maven. Project Maven was a Google AI project that uses artificial intelligence to detect people and objects um, for military applications, for example, um, in drones. Um, and um, these are applications of military surveillance that can result in matters of life and death. Um, and so very quickly, I think applications of AI that might originally come from rather benign um, goals like making the process of getting your coffee quicker and more user-friendly, um, those same technologies can be deployed in ways that are um, very invasive and ethically quite troubling. And so I think that brings us to this question of fundamentally when we take a step back, why should we care? Obviously there are the privacy implications, but also democratic implications in the case of Dr. Ko Wenja in Taiwan. What does it mean for a politician to be going to a tattoo parlor, to be going somewhere in the real world because of an AI powered system that told them to do so? What does that mean about the authenticity of our political leaders that we're electing? What does it mean about our civil liberties when um, a drone could be identifying us or perhaps misidentifying us in the process of making a life or death decision? And what does it mean about our freedom of expression or our free freedom of movement and association when all of these really invasive behavioral um, patterns are being used in the process of trying to determine something as simple as whether or not we get our coffee. Um, obviously, this will leave a lot of you wondering what you can do about it. Um, Tactile Tech has a great product called the Data Detox Kit that um, provides a lot of um, basic everyday steps that you can use to control your digital security and well-being um, in ways that feel right for you. So it's not telling you stop using Facebook, don't use Instagram, but it's about giving you some options so you can live a digital life that aligns with your own values. And in case you're interested in sharing it with members of your own friends and family, it's available in a number of different languages. So thank you so much for listening and um, I'm happy to take any questions should you have any. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Varun. Thanks also to, to Karen and Rand. Uh, I've seen there are some questions in the chat, so I'm going to hand over directly to Shanet that will ask some of you to unmute yourself and ask <clears throat> the questions directly. Thank you. So first we have to make sure that everyone can unmute himself or herself. Yeah, it's possible. So there are two questions, very similar questions about the hackers that maybe will become better. So Enrique, Giron or Lien, maybe you can speak out. Uh, hi, uh, this is Lian. Um, I'm not sure if Enrique is here because indeed our questions were very similar about hackers evolving in the future and being able to also hack encrypted information. Um, I think Rand and, and sorry, I misspelled your name earlier, um, already answered that it's uh, homomorphic encryption is quantum safe, so very, very unlikely we can break it uh, to the, in the foreseeable future. So I was wondering if you could explain that to someone like me who doesn't really understand what quantum safe means uh, and why, why that is unlikely to hack. Sure. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, I'm probably sure you heard about quantum computers. Uh, there are a new type of hardware that leverages, you know, quantum uh, effects to compute and solve problems uh, very, very, like, extremely fast. Uh, however, they can only solve specific types of problems. Quantum computers are not replacements for general purpose uh, processors. They really think of it like as a, as a new type of chip that can accelerate a very specific type of computation. Uh, it turns out that one of the things quantum computers is really good at doing is factorizing numbers. So if I give you a number and I tell you and ask you what are the composing numbers of that bigger numbers, uh, a quantum computer can do that like this. Uh, all of traditional cryptography 
literally 100% of cryptography and encryption that we use today is based on factoring numbers, which means that quantum computers effectively breaks 100% of security online as of today. Uh, so fortunately, we don't yet have a quantum computer that can do that, so that's good. Uh, and fortunately, we also have other types of encryption uh, that actually cannot be broken by quantum computers. Uh, and the type of encryption that is resistant to quantum computers, which we call quantum safe, post-quantum, if you prefer, post-quantum encryption, uh, turns out to have the same mathematical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the same, is, is from the same mathematical family as homomorphic encryption. And so, you know, if you can break this post-quantum new type of encryption, then there is no more security in the planet because existing cryptography, existing encryption is broken. If this new encryption is also broken, then everything is broken. And if everything is broken, I mean, you know, arguably privacy is not going to be the major issue anymore. Right, like, you know, there will be literally nobody safe anywhere on any computer in the planet. You know, so like, you know, we're talking states accessing other states, literally data on everything, you know, it's, so uh, hackers can try to do what they want. They cannot break something that's unbreakable by technology that does not even exist yet. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, so I, I wouldn't be worried about that. The biggest issue, the biggest worry wouldn't be on the encryption. It would be on rather the people who can potentially circumvent it. Uh, in most organizations, there is always someone who has access to the data, who has access to the code. If one of your developers is corrupted and they basically write buggy code with a backdoor, no level of encryption can protect against that. Uh, I think, you know, the biggest threat is corrupting people in organizations, not breaking cryptography. And hackers are really, really good at convincing people. Uh, actually, they would be really good on Tinder too, I'm pretty sure. So thank you. There was also a question from Julio and Nesto. I hope I pronounced it right about digital minimalism. Maybe you want to speak out, Julio? Yeah, hello. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, just a simple question. I mean, uh, what do you think about uh, living a life uh, of digital minimalism? I mean, is it even possible? Because nowadays we use that technology for so many things that I, I can't even know if we can live a life on that philosophy, if you, uh, sh shall you call it like that? So that's the question. Um, so first, no, I just want to make clear that technology isn't necessarily digital. Uh, you know, technology is basically whenever you use something to go beyond your biological abilities. So, you know, the first time a human took a stick to make a fruit fall from a tree, that's technology that extends your arm reach. Um, and so technology is necessary for sustainable societies. Like there's no way around it. Uh, now, the question is, you know, how much digital technology is potentially necessary? Well, uh, I'm definitely a techno optimist, quite frankly. I think that, uh, you know, the, the more we can automate things that we don't want to do, so things we decide to automate, the better. Uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's a possible future where we might end up working two days a week. That would be really good, you know. Remember, a hundred years ago, people worked a hundred hours a week. Uh, now, most people work, you know, up to forty, and that's pretty much it. Is it really that crazy to imagine that with automation and AI, we might only work, you know, sixteen, ten hours a week? Why not, right? I like this idea personally. Um, I think what we need really isn't necessarily less digital technology. What we need is less manipulation through digital technology and we need to feel safe using digital technology. Uh, the biggest reason why digital technology could have a negative impact is if people are constantly worried about using it and therefore aren't actually benefiting from the potential, or if people misuse it for manipulation, for surveillance, for you know, blackmail and things like that. 
uh, I have a very strong feeling that privacy and digital ethics are things that we can figure out. Uh, you know, we haven't had much time. I mean, the internet is, you know, 30 something years old. That's nothing, you know, in, in the scheme of like a human society, that's nothing. You know, we had, you know, we had hundreds of years to figure out, you know, uh, the industrial age. Uh, we only had 35 years of the internet and we have, you know, 70 years of digital and computers. Um, so no, I, I don't think we need to minim, minimize digital technology. I think we need to figure out how it can be used in a way that isn't detrimental to our lives. I'll, I'll just chime in as well, um, I, because I think I have a slightly different take on um, the question. You know, I think um, among, often among more activist-y oriented groups, um, there are a lot of different ways of dealing with these digital challenges. One of them is to fortify your own digital presence. One is to obfuscate it. Um, you can also, as um, you can also compartmentalize your digital identities online, um, or you can also reduce your digital footprint as well. And I think probably um, your question about digital minimalism is probably in sync with this idea of reducing your digital footprint. For example, um, going to a protest without taking your phone is a kind of digital minimalism, you could argue. Um, and I think, um, while I agree with Rand that I think we, um, we want to live in a world in which we can trust these digital technologies, I think one of the questions is as well, what are the intentions of, of some of the institutions and the people wielding them? I think one of the reasons I use this example of Dr. Koenja in my presentation is because there's nothing illicit or um, I think you could make, even make the argument morally reprehensible about what he's doing. But what does it mean that someone who's running for political office is using a company that's mining all the information that we put out in the public domain with no awareness as to how it could be used, building political profiles of us, making predictions about what our political inclinations are, and then using that information to inform what someone running for public office does. So I think um, one, absolutely one tactic that many people use, especially those in more activist oriented circles, is a kind of digital reductionism. Um, and we explain some of those tactics in the Data Detox Kit, if you're curious. So thank you. There is, thank ah, you. Karen, you also want to add something. So Ran, it's so, it's so great that you're so optimistic about the, our capacity to solve these problems, because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> And so, and I'm you to do that. yeah, I I, you know, I wish I had your <laughs> faith and I have to say, I'm much more ambivalent about how the future will shape up. And you're absolutely right. We have managed the adverse social consequences of our technological prowess in the past, but I, you know, the, the first industrial age has left us with a climate change emergency and we haven't solved that one and we need to solve that one soon. Um, and, because, and part of that was we just were not aware of the negative consequences at the time. We simply were not alert to them, we weren't sensitized to them, we weren't preparing for them. Uh, and, and my concern is that in a network digital environment, particularly given the capacity of these technologies to scale in real time and the pace of innovation and the elasticity of software, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that dinosaurs like me, you know, human lawyers and ethicists, we just don't have the, the intellectual and social capacity to work these things out with the same kind of agility, I think that's needed to match the ingenuity of the application. So I'd like to believe that you're, you're I'd like to share your optimism, but I, you know, as somebody who works in this field, I, I, I don't genuinely feel optimistic. I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm constantly telling people, we need to think and talk about these things and to raise awareness. Cause my own sense is that, that the average punter doesn't really have an awareness and I suspect that everybody's joining this couch session is quite well informed otherwise you wouldn't have joined the session but but I suspect that's probably unusual so I, uh, who knows I, we'll just I, have I to agree. wait and see. <laughs> I, I agree I, I guess you know uh, it's uh, uh, what I'm hoping for 
is that most people actually wouldn't have to worry or care about what they're using because we would do the effort upfront of making sure the foundations are making it safe for people individually and for society and for the planet. Um, I think technology in general is hard to predict in terms of long-term impact because of how complex the world is and how everything's interacting together. Even non-digital technology, right? Like, uh, you know, just farming, for instance. Uh, you know, like, hey, guess what? You know, we have great yield, okay? But we're depleting the soil. What happens then? It's very, very difficult to, to model the world as a whole. And my, my only concern is uh, I do not know how else but with technology, we can hope to sustain uh, our world with a growing population. Like technology is literally the only thing we have that enables you know, population growth. So do we stop having kids until we figure out everything? Or like, do we just maybe be optimistic that we'll try to solve as many problems uh, before they happen and that we find the solutions once they actually did happen as well. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can solve climate change. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking it might be with more technology in the end. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. So whoever wants to uh, ask a question, please uh, unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Okay, so Martin from Ghana, I had one quick question for Rand and one question for Karen. So for Rand, the question was about as we move towards homomorphic supremacy by 2025, I think the technology was going to change to ASIC, if I saw right. What did, would the impact on user devices be? So if let's say I have a phone or a laptop from 2020, when we get to that point where now encryption is changing and moving towards supremacy, do I necessarily have to ditch that device and get a new one? Because that device will still come with the, post, the problem of slow processing. And then for Karen, with regards to privacy and all the rules, the GDPR and all the rules guarding privacy, there are still exceptions. So for instance, public health safety in terms of security and whatnot. Who defines what line is that public health safety or that security risk? Who defines that? Because if, if it's a politician, a politician can always say that, okay, I deem this to be a public health and breach the privacy rules. So I don't know who is going to define that line. Thanks. So Rand, do you want to respond first and, th and then I'll jump in on the GDPR question? No? <laughs> Okay, so let me respond to your question. Thank you. It's a really good question. Um, so the question is, if there is, if there must be some kind of balance between privacy on the one hand and other legitimate public interests, including public health on the other, how do we determine where that balance should be drawn? So that's a really important and very challenging question. And people will obviously have different views on where the right balance is. And this is one of the challenges. So one of the reasons why I think uh, human rights law provides a really helpful way of thinking about how to negotiate that balance is because as I, as I showed you in, for example, Article 8 of the European Convention, it actually specifies the conditions that must be satisfied in order to justify a privacy intrusion. So it, the in, interference has to be prescribed by law. So it's not enough if the prime minister says so, there has to be a law that justifies the intrusion that is sufficiently clear and transparent. The intrusion or the interference needs to be necessary in a democratic society. That means it must be, for a start, it needs to be effective. So one of the challenges that's been posed by lots of these COVID apps is that they don't work, okay? And if they don't work, they're not necessary, okay? So they need to be effective in facilitating the achievement 
of the legitimate public interest. So in this case, the protection of public health. Um, and it needs to be proportionate. So the proportionality constraint is an important limitation on the extent to which privacy interferences may legally be justified. Now, ultimately, these questions are for uh, the courts where there is legal protection of privacy. And this is where countries that don't have legally protected privacy rights are vulnerable. Okay, because you can't challenge, and for example, challenges have been made to various um, government supported technological interventions on the basis that they breach human rights law or human rights standards. So this is the way in which human rights law negotiates this balance. But at the same time, it's important for the courts to be sensitive to societal preferences about where that balance lies. And so this in fact points to a, a tension between human rights on the one hand and democracy understood as majority um, decision-making on the other. So if most people say, yeah, bring it on, we'll, you know, we'll throw the kitchen sink at it, take my privacy away so long as we solve this crisis, but human rights says, no, 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 that's disproportionate, then you have a potential clash. But um, I suppose in that respect, we're putting a lot of faith in, in our courts system and, and, and to our judges at the top of the hierarchy to manage that balance responsibly. So that's a very full answer. I, I hope it helps to, to address the problem. Thank you. Rand, do you also want to answer the question of Martin? I mean, I think Karen is, uh, thinks about that a lot more than I do. Uh, you know, I, I guess my, my view has always been that uh, uh, governments and uh, governments tend to think of themselves as good people uh, short term. They have very little consideration for future governments that might not be very well intentioned. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's really important to have counter powers in place uh, so that we can, you know, effectively try to anticipate what might go wrong. Uh, in a scenario that seems very unlikely today. Um, so, you know, I don't think anybody's trying to do anything wrong, right? I think it's just, there's a different, it's just nobody would think of themselves as potentially abusive, right? Like, I don't think anybody in any office is thinking, let's pretend we're good people and actually really, you know, uh, make the whole country go uh, go down. No, I think, I think people have different theories and it just turns out that a lot of us here disagree with surveillance and, and this type of approach. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I would be okay with temporary uh, privacy sort of like, uh, uh, temporarily giving up privacy if we have guarantees that this cannot be extended in the future. Uh, what I'm against is what we very often see in some of those you know, security laws uh, where because of an actual current security crisis or health crisis, people are passing laws without an end date. And so that basically becomes part of society long term, way past the crisis that is supposed to fix. Uh, and we see this with COVID, right? There's a health crisis. Okay, we can all understand that. You know, we need data. We need a bunch of different things to fight it. Okay, why don't we actually make it clear that this should no longer be usable or applicable after the COVID crisis? Uh, we never know. It might come back. Well, we can just revote it again. Like you know, I think it's it, it's just it, it's just very very difficult to do anything if we don't know whether this is gonna be something we sign up for for a hundred years or if it's actually temporary. Uh, I just haven't really seen that many laws in France at least that were temporary to a crisis. They just extend them forever effectively. I think Martin had another question for you as well, Rand, uh, about the devices. Maybe you can answer just briefly. Okay, what was the question? Uh, the question was with respect to user devices. Move. Uh, well, so on the user device, there will barely be any impact because the user's device only does the encryption and decryption, which is pretty lightweight. Uh, the impact would be on the server in the cloud doing the computation. Uh, 
uh, they will need to pay the extra cost uh, of doing this extra computation, which is a reason why we need this to go as fast as possible. Uh, the faster it goes, the less costly it is for the service provider to implement homomorphic encryption. For the end user, I don't believe there would ever be any kind of noticeable difference. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about it, is the end user shouldn't and wouldn't care. Uh, they're using the same thing. They're, you know, they're, there is no difference to the user experience. If anything, with homomorphic encryption, you can even push more computation to the cloud without having to worry about privacy. Things that you do on device today could be do 100% in the cloud without any implication on privacy. So thank you. I think we have to come to an end and I want to thank Karen, Varun and Grant and I want to share my screen. I hope that's possible. Um, because this, this was our last couch lesson before summer, but we will uh, go on and we'll have uh, six more couch lessons in September and October. We start on September 16th with AI and peace and there will be uh, lessons about AI and language, AI and intimacy, AI and peace. Uh, I already said this, AI and democracy and a lot more and I hope you will join us again and I hope you will tell your friends and your family and spread it uh, through your social media channels and yeah hope to see all of you again and I wish all of you a wonderful summer. Thanks for listening and joining our couch lesson. <laughs>